Ah, okay, great. Well, uh, welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see there are a bunch of questions saved up here. Oh my. The question here, uh, from Aaron, do I think that having eventually lots of IoT devices will necessitate additional routing logic on local networks to prevent things like desktops from being slowed? Okay, let's take that question apart. It's kind of fun. Um, talk about it a little bit. So first of all, what is IoT? Uh, it stands for Internet of Things. I think it kind of originated, it was a phrase that originated about 10 years ago. And uh, the, the kind of the concept was at first, computer networks connect computers and they kind of also connect phones. Originally phones were connected just to the cell, telephone network, but then the telephone network started transmitting data and phones started connecting to Wi-Fi. And pretty soon a phone is just like a baby computer. Um, and uh, it's the same kind of story of connecting computers to computers through a network, either a local network or through the internet um, and phones to the same network, basically. Now, the thing that became popular is this idea of an internet of things. So uh, that is particularly uh, things with sensors, actuators. So for example, you know, the, the thermostat, the web, the the uh, the doorbell with a camera, the uh, uh, the the device that measures, um, you know, I think people were very keen oh, a number of years ago now. The plant that tweets, uh, you know, you have a a plant that um, uh, has a, a humidity sensor or a soil sensor or something, uh, and the plant will, um, uh, if something is, um, if it, if it needs to be watered or something, it will start tweeting at you. I have to say, I wonder in the modern question of the definition of bots on Twitter, I wonder how many plants there are that I have. Um, because uh, it was a was a thing. I, I think it I, I really was popular maybe oh, eight, 10 years ago now, um, of people talking about connecting uh, the ability to uh, to send messages to things like Twitter from inanimate objects, not inanimate, I don't know, but objects like plants and so on. Um, well, so anyway, this notion of Internet of Things it's sort of a question of what kinds of things can have sensors associated with them. I mean, I know for years now, I've had a toothbrush that has a you know, Bluetooth connection that uh, sends data somewhere of, of um, uh, and there are all these different things that now have uh, um, uh, sort of network connectivity. I mean, I think one that has kind of gone in and out of fashion is refrigerators um, of the question of whether for example, you have the refrigerator with a, with a camera inside and it's kind of figuring out when do you need to get more milk or something um, or a variety of other kinds of uh, mechanisms like that. Um, I think, you know, toasters, uh, one that often are raised as a, as a sort of a slightly humorous example of things that do or don't have kind of internet connectivity. Now, sometimes there are things where the final connection is made I mean, these different kind of levels of networks. There's, uh, just to, to talk about some of those, I mean, so there is um, uh, the internet where everything has, every device has some address and you have this whole mechanism for sending data uh, that, that um, across the internet. And the most common th way that you're interacting with things across the internet is there is a server and you are making requests, like you're saying HTTP, you're sending a request that asks for a web page, and you say, get me this web page, and the server responds and gives you a whole bunch of HTML code that then your browser responds to. That's a, a typical sort of transaction on the internet. Um, there's also uh, other kinds of um, uh, networks, like for example, on a local uh, Wi-Fi network, you are, uh, typically communicating with the outside internet through uh, just by having that be something where uh, I should, should where, where you have the point of the normal point of Wi-Fi is it's wireless. 
Um, and so you have radio communication as opposed to sort of the backbone of the internet, which is fiber optic cables and things like this. Um, but many of these uh, you know, pieces are getting blurred and as 5G networks come in, there'll be more and more things that are just purely wireless everywhere. So it's, it's kind of, I'm not sure that distinction can really be made, but each one of these different uh, systems, whether it's Wi-Fi or other kinds of things, there are definite, uh, definite ways that data gets sent through those networks. So Wi-Fi is one common mechanism. Another one is Bluetooth. Um, the, uh, these things have different uh, radio frequencies and different ranges and things like that. Bluetooth tends to be a shorter range. I don't know how far it stretches, maybe 10, 20 feet in free space, um, whereas Wi-Fi can be, uh, well, let's see, what? probably a few hundred feet or something, maybe longer than that. Depends on whether you have, if you have a, a kind of a, a big Wi-Fi antenna repeater, you can get it to go further and so on. And Bluetooth is much uh, lower power. And so for example, you can have battery operated devices that routinely use Bluetooth connections. Many mice and keyboards and things don't bother to have wires, they just use Bluetooth connections. Um, Bluetooth has, um, uh, there are different, uh, it's, it gets really complicated. There are different kinds of Bluetooth connections. Um, uh, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, was one that came in probably 10 years ago now. Um, and that's used by some kinds of uh, devices like, uh, you know, fitness watches and, and things like this. Um, if you look at kind of what is being sent by Bluetooth to your computer, your computer can typically be set up to communicate via Bluetooth with a device, but your computer kind of has to pair with that device. It says it's, it's this device, it has a certain ID and your computer kind of, you have to tell your computer, yes, I want your, the computer to be able to send data um, to and from that device. Um, and, but that's, uh, that's something that um, uh, works that way. I mean, there are, there are yet different kinds of, of ways to communicate like NFC, which is um, uh, the uh, mechanism where you have, um, uh, for example, your phone, and is it the same thing with, with credit cards, with um, uh, the tap credit card mechanism? I'm not sure, I think that's the same protocol, I'm not, I'm not certain of that. Um, but yet again, that's something which is using radio, but it's using radio in incredibly uh, low energy and short range. And the, and the funky thing about um, uh, some of these things with, you know, tap your credit card is that what's happening is that an electrical signal is being, that electrical, uh, you're, 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 you're getting some kind of circuit in your credit card to actually do a computation based on, but it's powered by, uh, I, I guess it's effectively powered by electromagnetic induction from the thing that you are tapping the credit card against. Um, there's a slightly different version of that, which is key fobs, where you have, I think they have little loops of wire in them connected to a little tiny microprocessor chip. Um, and uh, when you put that near the, um, uh, the sort of the door entry thing, it's inducing, I think, some small voltage in that little wire, enough to power the circuit, the tiny circuit inside the key fob. Um, and then it's, it's uh, basically the... the um, the door is sort of interrogating the key fob with, uh, you know, what, um, with essentially a small uh, piece of encryption that determines whether this is really the, the thing that, but what, what the ID of that key fob is. Um, but anyway, I think the, the, the original question here had to do with when there are lots of Internet of things, devices, will that sort of swamp the whole um, internet. I mean, I think these days there are a few billion computers in the world, actually ordinary computers, but there are vastly more kind of uh, computer-like devices and sensors and so on. And I think, I think cars like typically have 30 to 50 kind of little computers inside them, in addition to maybe one bigger computer. Um, and uh, lots of kinds of devices are starting to have little computers that possibly are connected to sensors that measure particular things. Um, you know, is that uh, what's the temperature of that at that particular in that particular room? What's the uh, 
uh, I don't know, lots of, uh, you know, I, I like, you know, have a little um, weather, weather station thing outside that is just measuring wind speed and temperature and humidity and things like that. That's another device that's communicating um, through the network somehow. Now, some of those devices, a pretty common mechanism is to have those devices communicate through things like Bluetooth with something like a phone or a computer, which then sends the data on to some, uh, perhaps some server somewhere across the internet. But sometimes those devices can also uh, communicate directly. And sometimes those devices are directly sort of plugged in to the internet and then they're, they're sending their information um, however they do. I mean, so for example, with Wolfram Language, um, which is bundled on the little Raspberry Pi computers that cost, I don't know, a few tens of dollars, um, the, uh, you can have a whole Wolfram Language running on the Raspberry Pi computer, and that computer can be connected to a camera uh, or wh whatever else, and some processing can be done locally, like it can decide, I, mean, I know somebody who made a kind of cat flap, dog flap thing, uh, where it uses machine, it uses our image identify function running on a Raspberry Pi with a camera to decide whether the thing that is trying to come into the house is a cat or a dog, and um, then makes some decision accordingly. Um, and I think that's uh, so. So there's always this question of: Do you do processing? Do you do that recognition of is it cat or dog locally on the computer that's there, or do you have to send data back to some central server? which is going to be the cat versus dog server, and then send a, send a message back to the, the, the flap to say whether to open or not or whatever else it was doing. So in any case, one of the issues, I suppose, is as you start to get uh, sort of lots and lots of devices that are trying to send data um, to the internet, what happens? Many of these devices, many of these sensors send data only quite rarely, like the, the cat flap, dog, dog flap thing is presumably, well, again, this is complicated. I mean, it is usually a good idea to try and process as much as you can locally before you have to send the data all the way to some remote computer. Um, because that's, it's, um, uh, if you can just have that local computer just run things, you don't have to spend the effort to send all the data across the internet or whatever else. When you are sending data, uh, or when different devices are operating on a network and you're sending data from different devices, there's another, we're, we're kind of submerging into lots of layers of engineering kinds of uh, things, but, but um, another big story is the story of QoS, the quality of service mechanism. And so the, the issue is, if you have multiple things that are trying to connect uh, through your, for example, let's say you have a, um, an internet connection at your house and you are, and, and there are multiple things that are going through that internet connection. You're looking at web pages, you're streaming a video, you're doing a VoIP phone call, you're doing you know, other kinds of things. There's a question of what gets priority. Let's say you're also uploading some big file or downloading some big file. What gets priority on that internet connection? And so there has to be sort of a, a pecking order of things. So, for example, if you are using the internet connection to do a phone call, you can really notice if the if the connection says, "Oops, I'm doing something else now," you'll hear a you know you, you, the person the other end will just freeze, or you won't hear anything, or they won't hear you, and that's bad. On the other hand, if you're uploading or downloading a file, and for a just for a moment the file stops transmitting as many bytes as it was otherwise. It's like, so what? It'll catch up and you'll eventually get the whole file. So that means that the, the, this QoS mechanism that sort of determines what has priority, um, you'll want to prioritize things like the uh, voice over internet, voice over IP, phone call to be higher priority than something like a file transfer because you really, you as a human really notice a glitch in the phone call, you wouldn't notice such a glitch in the file transfer. So there's a whole world of sort of optimizing these kinds of things. Uh, and sometimes you can have to adjust these things by hand to optimize, you know, what, what are the things that you as a human notice versus the things you don't notice. And that certainly helps in terms of some of these devices where it can matter. You know, usually there are two parameters that are important in network connections, throughput and latency. 
So throughput is just how much data can you ultimately get through the network. Like for example, if you're uh, watching a movie, in the end, you need to get all the frames from the movie through, you need to transmit them. Usually, by the way, in, in, in the way that streaming services work, if they detect that your network bandwidth, the total amount of data you can send through your network every second or something is lower, they will reduce the, the quality of the, of the movie. They'll reduce the resolution of the pictures so that you can still get the, you know, whatever it is, 30 frames a second or whatever the, the, the rate is that, that corresponds to the movie. Um, because otherwise, if you, if you stop getting frames, it's like your, you know, amazing movie with, with uh, you know, whatever it is, the, the, uh, the, you know, the dragon in space or whatever it is, you know, the thing will just freeze there because it didn't get the next frame yet. But so it's important, you know, if you're sending a movie, you have to ultimately get all the bits that are necessary to see the whole, you know, dragon in space or whatever it's doing um, uh, to see the movie. But it isn't so important if when you receive the, uh, those frames, they could be delayed by five seconds and you would never know. Uh, in other words, the movie, when you press go on the movie and it says it waits, it buffers up, it often says buffering, um, it, it, uh, uh, it'll, it's, it, is, it is getting ready so that it will show you, it, it will be, it, it doesn't, the latency, the fact that it doesn't immediately start playing, it, it's waiting, it's storing up enough stuff that it's pretty sure that as it goes on, it will always be able to fill, to, to get enough bits to you that it never has to stop the movie. Even though the movie might not be playing, the movie as you see it, for, for example, let's say the movie is of some event that's happening. It could be that the, you know, the camera is photographing the event. And if you were right there, you know, in the stadium looking at, at your computer or your phone, you would see that actually it's delayed by five seconds or something relative to the real life event. Um, but that latency is not important in that case when you're just watching the event, uh, you know, at home or whatever. On the other hand, if you're doing a phone call and there's a lot of latency, it's like you say, hello, and then it's wait, 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 wait for five seconds. And then the person, you know, here's your hello, and they say, hello, back again. And that's super confusing and doesn't work very well. So in, in the case of the, so latency is important in something like um, the, uh, uh, you know, a phone call. And so typically there are sort of trade-offs about how much latency versus how much throughput um, and uh, the different kinds of situations. Like for example, if you are sending data to a satellite, um, the satellite might be a long way away. And just by virtue of the speed of light, as your radio signal goes, the satellite comes back down again, there might be significant latency, but it might be the case that you can send huge amounts of data to the satellite. So there might still be high throughput. Um, and there are other cases where there is low latency, but also low throughput. That is, you can, it's all good. You can immediately get the signal, some signal through, and you know what's happening. Like for a for a keyboard, for example, communicating with a computer, there better be low latency or you're gonna have a weird situation where you press a key and nothing shows up on your computer screen. Um, but it's not so important what the throughput is because you know you, don't, you just don't type very fast. So there's no way that that, that can be a problem. If the, if the network connection for your keyboard has low throughput, so long as it has low latency, which means it's, it's fast to actually see the result of the key, that's all good. Well, let's see, that was a little bit of um, uh, discussion of that. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, Pontius is, is commenting that the implementation of IPv6 solved the problem of the number of possible internet addresses. Yeah, I mean, just to explain that, when you see an internet address, so, so an address like wolfram.com is, the domain name, and uh, that domain name has to be resolved into a raw address that is what's used in the tables that tell a computer how to send a signal that gets to that server. Um, and so uh, that's DNS domain name. What does the S stand for? It's a, 
DNS is the is the system that domain name res resolves domain names and turns them into um, uh, and turns them into these raw IP addresses. And it's sometimes very confusing that uh, often locally on some network there will be a cache of dom uh, of those translations between domain names and um, uh, and um, uh, IP addresses. But sometimes you will have to go, there's a whole hierarchy of domain name servers um, in, in the world, ending up with the, what is it, 13 root name servers that ultimately are the authority on how the domain name is connected to the IP address. Um, but uh, sometimes when you think, oh, I've got an internet connection, this is all good. But before you can actually reach the website you're trying to get to, you have to resolve the domain name, you have to go to a DNS server, and that's a separate transaction. That's a separate internet-like trans transaction on the internet, but it's not like a web transaction, like going to fetch data from a website. And so sometimes you'll be in situations, I don't know, it happened to me on planes, um, where the where the, DNA, the domain name lookup just doesn't work. And so uh, if you, in fact, could, you could actually reach a website by going to a raw IP address, um, but you couldn't, you can't do that, that lookup between the address and the, the raw, the, the domain name and the raw address. So it used to be the case that uh, the internet was based on IPv4, which is means what is the address? So a typical address is 140.177.10.20. That's a typical IPv4 address. Um, like 140.177 was, you know, we that's a class B network that was, so networks, uh, that they're these different, sort of sizes of networks, like a class A network bought the addresses that will be like the, the, um, the 127. No, that's a bad example. Uh, let's say 211. Um, uh, that, that, that initial number goes up to 255 um, because it is one byte, eight bits of, of data. Um, and so uh, let's say you've got uh, 217 or something. Um, you can have a class A network where you have all, where, you, where allocated to you and available for your computers are all the network addresses that start with 217 and then have all the other, uh, all the other bytes after that. You can, you can decide how to allocate all those things. Um, so it's like class A, class B, class C networks. And in the end, every computer uh, has, at least in the past, had uh, an IPv4 address, which was of the form that I mentioned, you know, 140.177.10.14 or something. Um, it's a little bit confusing because there also are local IP addresses that don't have the same sort of base, um, uh, sort of base thing. The, the thing I just mentioned, the same structure, but a different meaning. Um, okay, the thing I mentioned is for sort of global internet. Okay, so a number of years ago, uh, everybody realized that, that one was gonna run out of addresses um, because the, the total number of addresses is only um, uh, 256, probably 255 actually, 256 to the fourth power, um, which is, let's see, 238, 238, 238, let's see. Um, it's just 232, is that right? I think that's right. So that allows only, if I'm calculating it right, that allows only 4 billion devices. And you can easily run out of that. And not only that, it's also not completely efficiently allocated. Like for example, we used to have uh, uh, the, the whole of 140.177 was allocated to our company, which would allow us to have um, a huge number of devices. We don't have as many devices as that. So some of those internet addresses were simply not allocated. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so what, what happened is that was extended to IPv6, which means that instead of being four blocks of numbers, four bytes, um, there are six. And there's a whole giant adventure of sort of moving the internet to have everything work with IPv6. And it's going kind of slowly as these sort of changes of standards often do. But in the end, this problem of uh, you know, running out of internet addresses 
will be put off for a long time, at least. Um, it depends on what eventually thinks it needs an internet address, but for the foreseeable future, there will be enough addresses. Let's see, more things about engineering here, let's see. Um, okay, so there's a question from Paul here. As higher frequencies are used in Wi-Fi to achieve higher bandwidth, Wi-Fi range and penetration is reduced. Is there tech that would simultaneously increase both bandwidth and range? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the very common two gigahertz, which is so, so. okay, so when you are specifying a radio signal, you're, you're specifying the frequency of the signal that means the number of times in terms of an antenna that's causing the electromagnetic wave to be produced. That means it's kind of how often the electrons are going back and forth in that, um, in that little piece of, uh, in, that, in the antenna, how often the voltage is being reversed to push the electrons different ways to create the electromagnetic wave, how often you get from crest of wave to trough of wave and so on. And the, the wave is at least in, in uh, is going at the speed of light. Um, and so there's a conversion between how, how fast the, the wave is going up and down, we're going from peak to trough and so on, and the wavelength of the wave, that is the distance between peak and trough. Um, and uh, the, the antenna in a rough approximation, an antenna has to be a length that is somehow about the, the wavelength of the um, of the radiation of, of the of, of the wave, often you have quarter wave antennas and things like that, which are but it's it's on the order of the wavelength of the um, uh, of of the of the signal. So a pretty common wavelength was two gigahertz, two billion uh, sort of reversals per second. Um, and that corresponds to, I should know this, it's a, I think it's a few centimeters, is that right? Uh, wavelength, let's work it out. Two gigahertz is two times 10 to the nine uh, uh, cycles per second. Um, and what we want to do is, uh, um, uh, it's, the, it's the speed of light divided by that will give us the wavelength. The speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So it's three times 10 to the eight divided by two times 10 to the nine, which uh, this is where mental arithmetic is relevant and I'm gonna get it wrong, is uh, 1.5 times 10 to minus one. So 0.15 meters. So that would mean that at two gigahertz would be about 0.15 meters or 15 centimeters. So I was about right of the frequency for uh, of the wavelength corresponding to that frequency. So that was a pretty common cellular frequency and Wi-Fi frequency. Um, uh, there was also for, for some internal stuff, I think there was 900 megahertz, uh, that's 0.9 gigahertz. Um, and what's becoming more common is five gigahertz and even higher frequencies. And the, uh, the good news, okay, so another important fact is that if you want to send a signal, then what you're doing roughly when you send a signal is normally you have this electromagnetic wave, the radio wave, and it's just, uh, if, if at a particular frequency, it's just merrily going along peak to trough, peak to trough, it's making a sine wave, a perfect sort of regular wave. But if you want to actually send data, then you have to perturb that wave because the way you're, you're encoding information is by little wiggles on that wave. And there are different ways to put the wiggles on the wave. You can change the overall amplitude of the wave. You can change the frequency of the wave. You can do more complicated things, but you're basically putting wiggles on this wave. And the point is that you can't, if the wave itself has a frequency that is uh, the, you, in order to, in, in order to make, okay. So each wiggle, each bit, can't be at, at a smaller scale than the um, than the rate at which the the wave is uh, is going up and down itself. So you can't you can't send data. There's sort of a limit on how fast you can send data. How much how much you can make a change in the wave um, is you can't make a change that is uh, of a higher frequency. Than the wave, than the than the basic 
uh, sort of form of the wave itself. And so that means that if you want to send data at a higher rate, you need a higher frequency of radio wave to do that. Um, and you, you don't get to use the absolutely full, uh, um, full frequency of the wave. Uh, this, is, this is complicated. Uh, the, um, uh, let, let's not go into that. The, the, it's, it's, you, you, well, uh, if, if, you used, if you really used sort of the full frequency, you could change the form of the wave completely, and then you would kind of uh, interfere with, with folks who were using a wave of a different frequency. Um, so in any case, the higher the frequency, roughly the more data you will be able to transmit uh, per, uh, per second or whatever else. And so there's a push to have uh, higher frequencies used. So for example, if you go from radio waves, if you, um, uh, by the time if you increase the frequency, you keep increasing the frequency, you'll get to infrared, uh, and then you get to visible light and then to ultraviolet and so on. And so visible light, like a, a laser that's sending signals, a visible light laser that's uh, sort of um, sending, you know, now there's laser light, now it stops being laser light, now there's laser light again. You can send things at, at um, the frequency of that is more like terahertz um, in, um, actually more than that, let's see, that is, um, uh, now you see, I have to do a calculation again. I should know this cold, but I don't. Um, visible light, uh, typical frequencies there are things like 500 nanometers, um, which is, uh, so that's 500 times 10 to minus nine meters um, and uh, five times 10 to minus seven meters. Uh, somebody's gonna tell me I'm getting all of this wrong, but I think five times 10 minus seven meters and that is, if we want to find the frequency, we would, uh, let's see, we would take um, the speed of light uh, divided by that. So three times 10 to the eight meters per second divided by five times 10 to the minus seven uh, meters. So that's, um, uh, that's the three and the five, we're just gonna assume that they sort of cancel out. Um, that's uh, 10 to the eight divided by 10 to the minus seven is otherwise 10 to the eight plus 10 to the seven, uh, plus 10 to the eight plus seven, which is um, uh, 10 to the 15. So um, that's, uh, um, it's higher frequency than I thought it was. Hmm. Did I get this calculation right? So terahertz is still radio waves. That's terahertz radiation is what's used for things like airport scanners and so on. Um, so maybe this is right. It's, um, hmm, I think that's right. Well, that would be, uh, uh, that would be more like petahertz, but i have not, um, maybe it's in the hundreds of terahertz. Maybe I got it a little bit wrong there, but it's, it's um, so that's, so visible light has higher frequency than any of these radio waves. And so you can send data at a higher rate using visible light because it has higher frequency. And, and so if you're, if you're using visible light, um, you could, for example, uh, if uh, the the um, uh, if you're sending it through a, a fiber, well, the fiber reduces the speed a bit because it's not going quite at the speed of light. But if you're doing it just through the air, it's pretty close to the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, and if 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 you're so you could if you have a laser and a visible light laser, you could be sending data at a very high rate by just modulating by changing that that um, uh, that that light from the laser. Of course, the problem with la visible laser light is, well, it's, it's all well and good if you have two devices that have sort of a line of sight and you could, if you look from one device to the other, you could see that other device because there's light from that other device reaching you, um, then it's all good. But as soon as there's a wall in the way or something or some other object that doesn't let light through, then that's not gonna work. So a typical thing that happens is the higher the frequency, the more, you, the more data you're gonna be able to get uh, transmitted, but the more you're gonna be stuck with things like, oh, there's a wall there, um, you know, the light doesn't go through, the high frequency radio doesn't go through either. Um, as you go to, the, there are other effects like diffraction that allows uh, something uh, that where, where it isn't, like a, a laser beam will be just, it goes directly from here to there. Whereas for some of these kinds of, uh, there's, when, 
when the thing is acting more like kind of waves on an ocean, except these are electromagnetic waves, you can end up with this phenomenon of diffraction where the waves will not just go straight from here to there, but they'll be, they're, they're kind of, um, they'll be sort of, um, once they hit something, there'll be a new wave and it'll be kind of in circles and, it, and you'll, you'll not have to go straight in a straight line from here to there. And the lower the frequency, the more of that can happen. And also uh, many materials are, um, they have a different response at different, at different radio frequencies. And so some radio frequencies will happily succeed in getting through the material of a, a wall or something, and others will not. Uh, and different kinds of walls, you know, if you have a stone wall, that's kind of bad for most radio frequencies. If you have a, a piece of drywall, I don't know exactly what the characteristics are, but, but that's a, an easier thing to get through. So one of the issues is um, in a situation where you're using higher and higher frequencies, it's great in terms of being able to transmit more data, it's bad in the sense that you can't, um, you, you don't just get to have, you know, uh, like with a, a, an old fashioned radio or something, or, or even modern, uh, um, uh, that, that you can be sort of uh, in a room somewhere deep in a house and somehow the radio waves will, will get to you by, you know, they'll, they'll get through the windows and things like that. And then they'll diffract around this thing and, and it, it, it's, it's easier for them to get to you. Whereas if they're very high frequency uh, uh, waves, it's only going to be, uh, you know, do you have sort of a direct path and there's nothing in the way type thing. Okay, so the, the number one way that people expect to deal with that, particularly for things like 5G, the sort of upcoming uh, standard for phone, uh, phones and other mobile devices, um, the main way people expect to deal with that is by having, well, a couple of different things, but, but basically by having repeaters where you'll have a device that um, uh, gets the radio waves, the radio waves come to it, and it then retransmits those radio waves in different directions. And so even though it's kind of like you, you go from here to there to somewhere else, and, and it doesn't have to be a straight line because you get to the repeater and then the repeater will transmit something in a completely different direction. Now, in something like 5G, there's a lot of cleverness because uh, you are making it so that you're essentially transmitting often, you know, you, it knows your phone is in this place. So it tries to transmit the radio signal as if it was pointed directly, as if somehow the antenna was pointed directly at your phone. But the thing that can happen is when you have a big dish antenna, one of these big parabolic antennas that, uh, you know, you see with radio telescopes and things like that, um, that antenna can receive or transmit in a particular direction, but you have to turn the antenna, you have to physically turn the antenna so that it is oriented in the direction you want it to transmit in. There's a kind of a clever method uh, to avoid doing that called a phased array, um, where instead of actually physically moving anything, all you're doing is you're changing like, like different parts of an antenna. There's an antenna broken into pieces and different parts of the antenna are all transmitting a wave, but they're transmitting it um, shifted in some way. And that shift is the equivalent of having the antenna um, sort of tipped in a particular direction. And so you can kind of arrange by, by messing around with sort of exactly the, 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 when the wave starts in one piece of the antenna relative to when it starts in the other piece of the antenna, you can kind of um, sort of shape the, the wave so that, so, so, so that it is effectively um, being transmitted as a beam in a particular direction. And so that's how things like 5G work they have this kind of mechanism for, for arranging to send, to effectively steer the, um, uh, the signal to go in a particular direction, but there's not, nothing physically moving. It's, it's just a, a pure, uh, it's, it ha it's based on timing information about uh, when an electrical signal is in this part of the antenna versus that part of the antenna and so on. And that, that's some, um, uh, and, and in fact, 5G has another mechanism that is, it kind of sends out an initial kind of, um, what are they called, pilot waves? I forget what it's called. Oh my gosh, what is it called? Pilot wave, it's either that, or that's the term used in, in, in a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it's a, it's a confusion. Okay, so anyway, they send out an initial signal that um, kind of, uh, and then they 
watch kind of how that signal comes back. And that kind of maps out things like the geometry of the room you're in and allows it to know how it can best send signals that will reach the device that you're trying to reach and so on. It, it gets pretty complicated. And the, the, another thing that I'm, I'm sort of glossing over there is what's called multipath effects, where a signal could, for example, it might go straight from here to there, or it might bounce off a wall, or it might go through two different possible openings, and there might be multiple paths um, that a signal can go from the source of the signal to the receiver of the signal. And being able to sort of handle all of those different multiple paths is a tricky thing. And there are lots of, uh, uh, lots of work on kind of the best algorithms to do that. Let's see. Um, gosh. Uh, Questions here from um, Ernesto about gravitational waves and um, uh, traveling through Penrose's eons. Wouldn't this gravitational, wouldn't it make particles uh, wiggle at the quantum level? Okay, so there's a, I have to take this, this apart a little bit. So, first of all, let's talk about gravitational waves. So, uh, gravitational waves are uh, normally something like the Earth produces a gravitational field. It is, um, and that causes things to fall towards the Earth, for example. And the interpretation of that in the uh, you know, previous current, I would say, um, uh, the, the sort of the last hundred years interpretation of that has been that the reason that there is that, that that gravity happens is because the presence of the mass of the Earth is distorting the structure of space-time and is curving space effectively in such a way that even though, uh, let's say something is being is going past the Earth, even though the thing that's going past the Earth sort of thinks it's going in the shortest, is going in the shortest path, it's not going in a straight line because the space that it's going through is curved and so it's deflected and that deflection is a, is a consequence, you can think of it as a consequence of the fact that the Earth is producing gravity. So whenever there is a, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, whenever there's mass, it, it distorts the structure of space and it produces gravity. Um, now, when there's a, a separate phenomenon, which is once, once you're saying that, that gravity is this, de this deflection, this, this distortion of space, one of the things that can happen is you can have waves of distortion. You can have something where the structure of space is distorted and it makes something that, that's kind of like a, you know, it, it's, it's like a water wave, except that that distortion of the surface that you see on, on a water wave is in fact a distortion of the structure of space. And in particular, what it, what it means to distort the structure of space is that, for example, uh, two points that, that you sort of might think with this distance apart, if you kind of, let's say you have an object and you're moving it, uh, and that object sort of has a quotes fixed length, and you move it into different parts of space, the effective length of that object will seem to be different in different parts of space because the sort of the, the actual, uh, the, the, the measuring stick of space has changed. So in any case, the, the main things was a prediction of general relativity, um, Einstein's theory from 1915, that there should be gravitational waves, um, which is these kind of things that are sort of distortions of space-time that move through space, just like a water wave on the surface of water would move across water, just to make things super confusing in the, in the jargon of physics. There are things in water called gravity waves that have to do with the, the interaction of gravity with the surface of water. Gravity waves on water have nothing to do with gravitational waves in space-time, except for the fact that they have somewhat similar names. Um, but in any case, the, um, in space, uh, it is a necessary consequence of the, the general relativity theory of gravity 
that there will be gravitational waves and that there will be these propagating distortions in space time. And uh, for a long time, these were kind of a theoretical thing. And then about five, six years ago, uh, gravitational waves were detected as the, the two big detectors, one in Louisiana, one in Washington state. And how do you detect them? Well, you basically detect gravitational waves because the, the length of things will change when the gravitational wave comes through. Because effectively, one is changing the structure of space and one's changing it every time the, you know, the gravitational wave is coming through and, and it is effectively changing the length of an object. So these, these um, devices have these kind of long arms of, I don't know, how, how long is it? It's like a mile maybe? I'm forgetting, I've seen it, but I've only seen the outside of the tunnel. Um, maybe it's, maybe let's say it's a mile long. And you're, you're measuring the effective length of this mile long thing. As the gravitational wave comes through, that length is changed because the, the, the effective length is changed because essentially the measuring stick of, 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 the, of, of the structure of space is changed. And in order to detect this, you're using using basically light bouncing back and forth down this arm and you're looking at very tiny changes in the way in which interference of light works as a result of the length of this arm changing and so that's how you detect a gravitational wave and it's a little tricky because uh well gravitational waves um the deformation associated with gravitational waves is always what's called the quadrupole deformation so it isn't when I'm telling you it's just changing the length of something. It's not quite the right story. It's it's like squashing a thing in one, one direction and pulling it out in the in the uh, in the orthogonal direction in the in the opposite direction. So it's like you're pushing in and pulling out, and that's gravitational waves. That's what they do is they they make these quadrupole deformations that uh, push out in one direction and, and pull in in the other direction. So okay, what's the analogy between so electromagnetic waves are uh, something that um, uh, it, they, they have many characteristics the same. They, are, I should say gravitational waves uh, go at the speed of light and it's even been measured. They seem to go pretty accurately at the speed of light. Um, and they, uh, when electromagnetic waves are like radio, for example, are produced when you accelerate an electric charge. Um, when you are moving an electric charge, it's going up, it's going down, it's going in an antenna, you have a voltage, it's pushing the electric electrons up and down. You move those electrons, those electric charges, you move them, you accelerate them, you first push them to go up, then you turn around and make them go down. That ex repeated acceleration produces an electromagnetic wave. It's the same thing with gravity, that accelerating charges accelerating masses produce gravitational waves. And even a, 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 a star that's be, a planet that's being kept in orbit around a star, if it's a binary star, one star is orbiting around the other, or that they're orbiting around their, their common center of mass, then, then that the fact that you are you're continually accelerating the thing to keep it in orbit, to keep it going in a circle, otherwise it would just go in a straight line if you didn't, if you didn't uh, exert a force, keep it accelerated and so on. Um, even that produces gravitational waves, but the most intense gravitational waves that are produced are by pairs of black holes that spiral in and are going, uh, they're, they're, they're heavy, they're fast, and, um, uh, that, and they produce uh, intense gravitational waves um, because, uh, um, and they do so particularly as they spiral in and eventually two black holes will merge as they spiral in, they go faster and faster and they produce more and more intense gravitational waves. And the, the final moments of in-spiraling of, of black holes, um, final maybe five seconds or something, that produce very intense gravitational waves, intense enough that the detectors we have will detect a, a merger of two black holes, a, a, a in-spiraling of black holes, pretty much all the way across the universe at this point. Um, and, and they happen, oh, how often is it? Every few days one of those black hole mergers is happening somewhere in the universe and is detectable. And there are gravitational waves that we receive from those things. Um, and and, and the, the final moment is this, uh, you know, about five seconds or so of, of kind of, you see these, these um, uh, you see kind of a signal in the gravitational waves of, it, of, it, of the um, it kind of um, 
goes up and down in intensity um, and then eventually disappears as, as the black hole kind of merges into one. And, and there are, um, in fact, uh, even in our models, we can, we can, looks like we can reproduce that, that kind of ring down, that, that effect of the, of the in-spiraling black holes. And then the, the kind of, um, once, the, once the final single black hole is formed, it kind of blobbles around like a bell um, and eventually becomes a nice spherical black hole. But as it, as it rings down, um, it still emits gravitational waves. So, okay, so that's sort of the story of gravitational waves as they come from things like black hole mergers. Now, it's also the case, uh, let's see how to explain this. Um, okay, so electromagnetic radiation produced by accelerating charges. We can sort of do it on demand when we make radio and things like that. When you just have something that's hot, you have a bunch of electrons and atoms and things whizzing around because that's what heat is, is these atoms moving around and so on. And you end up with the same kind of phenomenon that you've got these charges moving around all that kind of thing. You're going to produce, uh, is that the right way to explain it? Yeah, that's an okay way to explain it. Um, you're going to produce a certain amount of electromagnetic radiation. Anything that's hot, is going to produce a certain amount of electromagnetic radiation. Things glow red hot, then white hot, then blue hot, and so on. Um, that's producing different frequencies of electromagnetic, different peaks in the, in, the, in the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation from things that are peaked in the red uh, part of the spectrum, which is lower frequency, then things which are spread across the visible spectrum, so it's white, then things that are kind of zooming off into the ultraviolet. So you, the part that's visible is just the blue part of higher frequency. Anyway, so you get what's called black body radiation, um, which is radiation that is produced by, as a result of, uh, uh, let's say, heat, and then that you can kind of have distant, well, okay, so, so things, I'm trying to think what the best way to explain this is, because I'm about to, I'm about to run into a bump in this explanation. But in any case, the, the, the um, uh, when you, when you just have, you, you, you can, you just have uh, electromagnetic radiation where it's sort of, there are, uh, there are photons that are going, that, that there's electromagnetic radiation that's kind of in some, let's say, cavity where the walls of the cavity are hot and you're just getting, um, uh, there's just a bunch of electromagnetic radiation inside and the hotter the walls, the, the change of the spectrum of radiation. In fact, in 1900, a guy called Max Planck uh, studied the experiments on um, uh, on that black body radiation and on the spectrum of black body radiation, and that's how uh, he ended up concluding that there must be discrete quanta of electromagnetic radiation in order to account for the distribution of that spectrum, and that's what eventually led, uh, particularly through Einstein's work, to the idea of photons, particles of light, and so on. But in any case, when there's when things are hot, you'll have uh, black body radiation, electromagnetic radiation. You also have other kinds of radiation. So you also have uh, gravitational radiation. Um, you also have, and that's something which, you know, think of all those little th things, you know, if, if you have something hot and things are moving around and they're accelerating and so on, they're going to produce gravitational radiation too. And so there is uh, the sort of most dramatic version of that is the cosmic microwave background which is a black body radiation that is left over from when the universe was very hot in the very early stages of the universe. And, and the, the bump that I was watching myself run into is explaining the fact that it's a little bit different when you have a cavity that has walls and things are, are producing uh, and you have sort of temperature because things are, are sort of whizzing around inside the walls, producing electromagnetic radiation that way. And what happened in the early universe where sort of in a sense, the, the, um, uh, every particle there was, um, uh, had a certain, um, was, was moving around with a certain energy. And that's kind of the way that, uh, that, that leads to this black body radiation. But, but basically what happened is in the early universe, um, every possible kind of radiation like that uh, had to exist when the universe was hot enough. The universe, when it was sufficiently young, 
was very hot, very high temperature. Things were moving around very rapidly. As it got bigger, the temperature goes down. Um, and uh, uh, at, this, uh, at this stage of the universe, the photon, the electromagnetic background radiation is at 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, 2.7 kelvins. That's minus 270, I can't do the arithmetic. Uh, 260, uh, oh my gosh. Um, 266 minus 266 degrees centigrade would be the uh, effective temperature. Did I get that right? No, minus 270 um, degrees centigrade would be the effective temperature of the uh, of the photons in uh, throughout the universe right now. Now, trickily enough, the um, uh, the temperature, so there are other forms of background radiation in the universe. There's, there's electromagnetic background radiation at 2.7 kelvins. There's also neutrino background radiation. Neutrinos are very light, almost zero mass particles that interact very weakly. Um, neutrino background radiation is about 1.9 kelvins. Um, and there's also gravitational background radiation, which is presumably the much lower temperature. The reason for these differences of temperature is because these um, different uh, kinds of radiation, well, as the universe, as, as the things, sort of the heat in the universe, okay, everything in the universe is hot, but gradually some things decouple from the things that are hot. So what do I mean by this? So for example, in the case of electromagnetic radiation, um, when the universe was above, uh, Oh, what is it? Let's say 10,000 degrees centigrade, but that's not exactly right. It's something of that order, but that's not, it's not exactly that. Um, was above some number of thousands of degrees centigrade, um, the, the atoms in the universe will, be, will have been, uh, the electrons in them will have been stripped away. And that means that you have something that's kind of like fire, plasma. You'll have something where photons don't get through. There, it's, it's opaque to visible light. Um, but at some moment, as the universe cools down, atoms will form. It's so-called recombination. Atoms, I don't know why it's called recombination, because the things were always uncombined before that in the, in the, um, in the history of the universe. But, but at that moment, about 100,000 years after the beginning of the universe, um, things cool down to the point where the electrons can get stuck in atoms and you have ordinary neutral things like hydrogen atoms. And at that point, the universe becomes effectively transparent to, to things like uh, to, to electromagnetic radiation. Um, and so from that point on, for a photon that was created earlier than that, a photon can just merrily uh, keep moving across the universe after that, and it doesn't expect to hit anything. And eventually it might hit the detector that we have that detects the 2.7 Kelvin um, uh, cosmic microwave background. But th that moment of decoupling that happens maybe 100,000 years after the beginning of the universe, um, the, 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 um, the temperature that the, uh, the photons get to is determined by when that happens. So the neutrinos, they decouple about one second after the beginning of the universe, and they have a, a and that means that, uh, oh boy, this is complicated. The expansion of the universe has caused the temperature that these things had at the moment of decoupling to be shifted. And in the case of neutrinos, it'd be shifted down to 1.9 kelvins. So in the case of gravitational waves, there should be a background of gravitational waves from the early universe. Um, what its temperature is, I'm not sure, but it will have decoupled much earlier in the history of the universe, I think, um, and therefore have a, a lower temperature. Um, and that term, um, uh, it's all a bit obscure what you mean by temperature for something like a gravitational wave. And, and there's a little bit more to explain to really say exactly what that means. Um, but roughly it's sort of the, the, the energy associated with gravitational waves. So question I think had to do with a model of the universe in which um, uh, the, um, um, in which we have the universe, it's expanded, Maybe it expands to a point and then the gravity of the things in the universe pull on the expanding universe so much 
that the universe can't expand anymore. It kind of turns around, it starts contracting again, and then there's a big crunch as everything is pulled back together. Everything that had expanded out is now pulled back together. Big crunch. When there's a big crunch, everything comes back together in this crunch. And then it crunches so hard that it explodes again and starts expanding again. This is a conceivable model, probably not what really is happening, a conceivable model for the long time history of the universe, that it's a series of these eons where it will be expanding for a while, contract, expand, contract, expand. And the big question is, does anything survive the big crunch? Is there any uh, sort of information that can uh, get through that moment when the universe has, has crunched down before it starts expanding again. I have to say, I haven't really thought about this, but I think in our models of physics now, um, in our uh, model of physics based on uh, discrete structure of space and so on that we've developed in the last few years, um, I suspect that question can be answered of what survives or what can survive. And I think the answer, uh, let me think about that for a second. Um, so that the microscopic structure of space probably there will be echoes of previous eons that conceivably you could reconstruct from the microscopic structure of space. But let me tell you why that's hard. So let's say you are, oh, I don't know, you've got, um, um, you've got an ice sculpture and um, it's a terrific ice sculpture and it's in the shape of a lion or whatever else it is. And then somebody comes along with a, with a thing that really heats it up and the ice sculpture just turns into steam. Okay, it is still the case that in all of the detailed motions of the molecules, let, let's say it's in, a, it's in a container, a nice container where you, you've, the molecules, when they, whenever they hit the walls of the container, they'll bounce off and things like that. As you heat up your, your ice sculpture lion, um, eventually it, it turns into steam, but every molecule from the ice sculpture lion has a very particular place that's determined by the fact that this molecule was from the pore of the lion, but now it's steam. And so that molecule is bouncing across the container, hitting a wall, bouncing again, bouncing, bouncing, bouncing all over the place. And you know, when you look inside this container, it says, I've just got a bunch of steam in this container. But if you looked in incredible detail, you would realize that the particular motions of molecules that are in that steam were ones that uniquely were the right ones to eventually have come from the ice sculpture lion. So in a sense, the information of the ice sculpture lion is still present in the detailed motions of these molecules, it's just really hard to extract because you, you have to identify what are all these molecules and which one did that and oh, that collided with this, let's back up the information of that. It is something which is computationally uh, completely infeasible to do. It's a phenomenon that the fact that that's infeasible is a result of this phenomenon that I call computational irreducibility. But in principle, if you were to allow yourself to be a sufficiently sophisticated computational being with sufficiently good sensors that could measure all these molecules, in principle, you could say, you see steam, I see the result of a, of a lion ice sculpture. And so it will be with the, uh, uh, the sort of the big crunch in the universe. Um, what somebody might say, all I see is a crunched together sort of microscopic structure of space. Somebody else might say, but actually, um, I can, if I do this reconstruction back again, I could realize that that crunched together thing is the result of some giant civilization that managed to figure out how to make starships and all kinds of things like that. And yes, it all ended up in this, in this crunch down in this little, little tiny effects and the structure of space um, that are not what has been set up for an observer like us who has who is looking only at the large scale structure of space and so on there's nothing there just like there's nothing there in the steam that came from the lion ice sculpture it just looks like a bunch of gas molecules bouncing around but really if you could decode that you would see that it came from something something remarkable now Having said that, I, I do wonder a little bit in our models of physics, there is a total information content of the universe that is determined by the actual number of atoms of space in the universe. And that number of atoms of space can change over time. And if you simply don't have enough atoms of space in the universe, you simply don't get to know, you don't get to record 
more information. Just like if you, well, actually the gas molecules analogy is a little different because with gas molecules in the usual way of thinking about it, you can have a precise velocity of a gas molecule and that precise velocity specified to, you know, a hundred digits of precision or something could give you, which is probably not realistic to actually do, but in theory, you could do that and it would give you a huge amount of information. And that nothing like that will work in the case of, of um, if, if you're dealing with a discrete collection of atoms of space, if you've only got a trillion, trillion, trillion atoms of space, then I'm sorry, you can't encode, uh, you know, all of the knowledge of the galaxy type thing. It just doesn't fit in what you can encode in a trillion, trillion, trillion atoms of space. So there might be some different limitations there, um, but when it, just the fact that you've crushed all matter down to something which is essentially just gravitational waves, uh, a version of just saying it's all just the structure of space um, is, is not really a thing. Now, I have to say in our models of physics, everything is just a feature of the structure of space. And so things like particles, like electrons and so on, they are just detailed features local features of the structure of space, just like in a fluid like water or something, uh, you can have vortices, you know, little eddies going around or, or in, in the atmosphere, you can have, you know, uh, you can have hurricanes, tornadoes, things like this. Those are all, you know, what is a tornado made of? It's made of air, but nevertheless, there's a definite structure to the tornado and the tornado can move around and do all the things tornadoes do, but it's ultimately made of air. And so similarly, what we are pretty sure is true is that things like electrons and, and all the particles that we're made of, photons, all these kinds of things, are ultimately just made of space in the same kind of way that tornado is made of air. Um, and so uh, this question of whether uh, when you have deconstructed everything, where there are no particles left anymore and all you have is features of space, you've still got the same raw material that you made particles out of. It's just that the space has been so ground down that you no longer can identify, oh, look, there's an electron there. Just like you, you, might, you, you might not be able to say in the air, oh, there's a, you know, this thing here is the beginnings of a tornado or something. You just can't, can't tell that, it, that it's there. So that, that's um, uh, a version of that. Um, let's see. Well, there's a question here from Eggy. How do we still see radiation from the other universe? Um, Okay, so so uh, this is a this is a very confusing thing. It's a little bit of a ge geometry exercise. Okay, so um, when we point a telescope out into space, into the sky, we may see a galaxy far away, and we know that galaxy is, uh, let's say, a hundred million light years away. That means that light that we are receiving now from that galaxy really started from that galaxy 100 million years ago. It took 100 million years for light from that galaxy to reach us here. Now, uh, the, and so the question is, let's say there is something from the early universe. So the universe is about 14.6 billion years old. Let's say there's light that started its journey um, 100,000 years after the beginning of the universe, as lots of light did. And the question is, where do we see that? What, where do we point our telescope to see light that started its journey that long ago? And the answer is we can point it in any direction we want because the way the geometry works, it's kind of like, it's, it's as if we see the beginning, as I mentioned, the galaxy 100 million years ago, you know, there's a galaxy in that direction light started 100 million years ago. Another galaxy in a slightly different direction, maybe light started 200 million years ago. Um, and as we look deeper and deeper, as we sort of focus our uh, telescope, we just look in different directions and we'll see galaxies that start where the light started 200 million years ago, 300 million years ago, whatever. Um, but, uh, and let's see, those galaxies, how to explain this. This is always a, a, a little bit of a geometrical uh, brain twister, but essentially what, what's true is that, that the, in any direction you point your telescope, you will see light 
that comes from the beginning of the universe. In some cases, there will be things in the way that are where the light originated there much more recently than the beginning of the universe. But it doesn't matter in which direction you point your telescope. Um, it, you know, focusing far enough away, the things that, 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 that it will correspond to light that started at the beginning of the universe. Now, what, why, is this, why does it work that way? It's because of geometry of thinking about, you, you can sort of understand this better if you think about the whole sort of space-time geometry of the universe, not just looking at things far away in space, but also dealing with um, the uh, time in the universe and the fact that uh, you are seeing light cones, you're seeing, let's think how to say this. Uh, hmm. Um, well, uh, but the, the basic idea is that a photon that this is always very confusing. Let's see. Um, let's imagine. Yeah, I mean, the, the end result is that you get to see the early universe. Uh, the only way you would not see something from the early universe is if there was a galaxy in every direction you look. And actually, that's kind of a mysterious thing in the universe that it's called Alba's paradox. Um, the fact that the sky is not bright. Because you might think if there were enough galaxies and if the universe was old enough that you could, um, uh, the, um, uh, that in every, if, if there were galaxies far enough and far enough back, then in every direction you look, you might see a galaxy because sometime there will have been a galaxy in that direction. But we don't see that. Um, and, and that's partly a consequence of the fact that the universe is not infinitely old. And there are many directions we look where we don't see any galaxies at all. And, um, and in those directions, we are seeing back to earlier times in the universe before the formation of galaxies and so on. We're seeing back to the things that were at the very beginning of the universe. You notice Parker here is suggesting the analogy of a balloon expanding. Yes, I was thinking about that analogy. That is sort of a standard analogy that's used. And as I was thinking about it, I did, I, that analogy wasn't making a lot of sense to me. Um, the, uh, uh, a, a common kind of way of thinking about the way the universe works in terms of its expansion is that the, um, uh, that imagine you had the surface of a balloon, you had a bunch of points on the surface of a balloon, you blow the balloon up and all these points all move further away from each other. Now, by the way, a confusing thing about the expansion of the universe is that not everything in the universe expands. Like we don't expand. We are still our meter whatever tall and will continue to be that height. And it's not the case that we expand. Our galaxy doesn't expand. But a galaxy that is far away from us is moving away from us as a result of the expansion of the universe, much like these things on the balloon. And the, the kind of the rule is if, if the, if, if the thing that you're looking at is gravitationally bound to the thing, the, the, the thing you're, you're in. So for example, if you have two galaxies and they're orbiting around each other, they're kind of like, there's gravity pulling these galaxies together. If there's that kind of gravity pulling these galaxies together, then you won't see them expand. But if the galaxies are kind of so far apart, there's no gravity pulling them together, then the essentially force of expansion of the universe will cause those uh, those galaxies to be pulled apart. It's called the Hubble flow after Edwin Hubble, who discovered the expansion of the universe uh, experimentally um, in the 1910, 19, uh, 1920s actually, yeah. Uh, the, um, and so that the, the Hubble flow is like a small force on everything that's pull, pulling things further apart. But when things have other forces that hold them together, it's a very, very tiny force and it doesn't cause things to go apart. But that's the thing that is kind of reflecting the overall expansion of the universe. Well, okay, I should probably... Um, uh, um, oh boy. 
A lot of interesting physics questions here. There's one from David here. Is it theoretically possible to detect individual gravitons by launching space probes into black holes? Um, um, I don't see an obvious way to do that. So just like electromagnetic waves, radio waves, things like that, they behave like waves. Electromagnetic radiation in general can be both thought about in terms of waves and in terms of particles, photons in the case of electromagnetic radiation. In the case of gravitational waves, the same thing is true. You can think about them as waves, or presumably you can think about them also as gravitons. That is uh, sort of particles of gravitational radiation. Now, I have to say that in our theory of physics, I actually haven't thought about this. It's actually somewhat interesting to think about what the structure of gravitons is in our theory of physics, uh, because we understand how gravity can occur from sort of large scale features of the structure of space. And we understand how particles like electrons can exist like kind of vortices in the structure of space. But when you ask about gravitons, it's an interesting question because it is, in a sense, you can always think of, you know, when you have an electromagnetic field, you can always say, oh, I'm gonna think of that field as a collection of photons. There's one photon here, one photon there, one photon there. You can decompose the electromagnetic field into a collection of modes that correspond to photons. Uh, you can say this field can be thought of as a photon going in this direction with this energy, a photon going in that direction with that energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you can make it up as a sort of sum of photons. And I suppose the same should be true of a gravitational field, even in our models, but it's actually an interesting question how that really would work. It's a good question. You should pin that as a, as a thing for somebody to study at our upcoming summer school. Um, so in terms of the detection of, of gravitons, uh, the, the main thing that one can expect to detect in our models of physics is the fact that space is discrete. You know, if you say, I've got some water, it seems continuous, but actually it's made of molecules. How do you detect that it's made of individual molecules? One of the first ways it was detected was through Brownian motion. Uh, you put a chap called Brown, uh, who knows what it was actually in, but somebody put little pollen grains on the surface of water and could see that they were very, the pollen grains didn't weigh very much. And so it didn't take much to kick them around and individual molecules hitting the pollen grains kick the pollen grains. You can see kind of discrete motion of the pollen grains. And that kind of is a clue that water is not really continuous. It's made of discrete things. And so one can imagine a similar kind of phenomenon with the structure of space of what can you have that is a very sensitive probe of the structure of space and that's sort of kicked around by the discreteness of the structure of space. And there may be things associated with uh, rapidly rotating black holes and so on that have that uh, characteristic. I, I don't think, I don't immediately see a way. See, the problem is around a black hole, it's very calm when a spacecraft falls into a black hole. The actual moment of falling through the event horizon after which the spacecraft can no longer send light signals that escape the gravitational field of the black hole. That actual moment of falling through the event horizon, as far as the spacecraft is concerned, is a very calm moment. Nothing dramatic locally happens. It's just that those signals that the spacecraft might have been able to send to the outside world, they'll get weaker and weaker and weaker and eventually boom, they're no longer, can't, can't, can't reach the outside world. But there's nothing sort of dramatic that happens that's sensitive to the microscopic structure of the gravitational field that's there. Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't quite see how that would work. Um, and uh, okay, we've got lots of other questions here, which I think we're going to have to leave to another time. Um, but uh, all right, so we went today from um, talking about Wi-Fi and a bunch of engineering details of 5G telephony and so on to talking about gravitational waves and gravitons and the structure of space. Um, I suppose the thing that might bring them together is, will we ever signal using gravitational waves? You know, one of the things that's a common sort of idea of science fiction is, you know, actually there's an intergalactic internet out there 
but it's using uh, signals of type X in that intergalactic internet. And it's kind of like, as soon as you manage to send and receive those signals, you're in the club and you get to communicate with all the inter, you know, intergalactic aliens, so to speak. And people thought that, you know, 100 and something years ago when radio was new, they thought, oh gosh, we've got radio signals and we can kind of detect there's some weird radio signals that come from the ionosphere um, of, of around the earth. And um, uh, people sort of heard those radio signals and were like, that must be signaling from the Martians. I think Nikola Tesla was quite enthusiastic about that idea. Um, and um, uh, the, the, you know, now that we have radio, now that we're in you know, the, the end of the 1800s and we've invented, discovered radio, um, now we're gonna be, it's gonna be a kind of intergalactic civilization, we're part of the club. Of course, it didn't happen that way. And uh, those radio signals weren't uh, anybody's ordinary definition of an intergalactic civilization. One can differ on whether one thinks that there's sort of uh, uh, that the ionosphere has kind of a mind of its own, but it isn't what we usually would think of as sort of a a, a separate civilization. But um, so people then wonder, oh, if you look at laser signals, for example, flashes of light, you know, going across the galaxy of, of you know signaling from here to there. Um, maybe there would be some sort of extraterrestrial intergalactic signaling in, in laser pulses and people look for those. And then maybe, well, maybe that's not it. Maybe it's neutrinos. Maybe there are people sending, you know, all kinds of uh, great, you know, uh, great forms of literature in, you know, in, in extraterrestrial alien languages, so to speak, across the galaxy, all encoded in neutrino signals. Or maybe it's gravitational waves. I don't think it's any of these things. I don't think that's the right idea for how to think about sort of alien intelligences, but it's kind of an amusing sort of science fiction-y thing to think about. As soon as we have good enough gravitational wave detectors, we'll discover somebody sending an encyclopedia in gravitational waves. I doubt it, but um, it's an amusing thing to imagine. And uh, it's kind of a, a thing where, where we can kind of say, what are the different forms of signal that can go across the universe. And it's basically things that are typically particles of zero mass, like photons and gravitons, that go at the speed of light and that don't get absorbed too much by other kinds of things that exist in the universe. Those are sort of our candidates for things that can be used to signal across the universe. Um, although radio does pretty well and doesn't get absorbed much as you go, you can have a radio signal that will go all the way across the universe or, or an electromagnetic signal goes all the way across the universe. All right, well, we should wrap up there. Uh, thanks for joining me and uh, see you another week.